Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Norma Villanueva. I am a program director in the Office of Special Education. I will be hosting today's afternoon webinar on best practices for scheduling, preparing for, and holding IEP meetings. There are some webinar ground rules and group norms. First of all, if you would be so kind as to mute your phones in order to, maxim to minimize any background noise for you and your colleagues, please be aware that we will have folks joining this presentation throughout the webinar, both by computer and phone, and also joining through the conference call, phone only, and following along with the PowerPoint presentation independently. So in order to make sure that everyone knows where we are in the presentation, the slide numbers will be referenced regularly. We would like you to engage. There will be several opportunities to stop and jot on your personal note page that was sent to you as an attachment with your invitation throughout this webinar. We strongly encourage you to jot down some notes, some thoughts, and some questions. This time has been designated to give you important information and ensure that you understand what the best practices are for scheduling, preparing for, and holding IEP meetings. If you have joined this presentation through the webinar, you can enter questions into your chat box. If you have joined this presentation through the conference call only, please note questions throughout the presentation on your personal notes page. All participants will be given a survey link at the close of this presentation where you will share thoughts on the efficiency and helpfulness of this format and information that's being presented. We also would like you to enter all remaining questions. We will be creating a comprehensive frequently asked questions and answer document that will be posted on the educator portal upon completion of all webinars. The webinars began yesterday, they are running today, and tomorrow there will be two more webinars, one at 8.30 in the morning, I'm sorry, one at 8 o'clock in the morning until 8.30, and the last webinar will be from 3.30 to 4 o'clock tomorrow afternoon. After that, you can look for postings on the educator portal. By the end of this presentation, we hope that all participants will be able to articulate the timelines for completion of various types of meetings, that all the participants will be able to implement best practices for planning and scheduling meetings to ensure compliance with the timelines, and that all participants will be able to identify tools and resources that are available to help keep meetings timely. The agenda for this webinar is as follows. There will be an overview. We will talk about scheduling the meeting, preparing for the meeting, holding the meeting, activities that need to be completed after the meeting. We will be sharing some additional resources and providing closing remarks. We are now on slide number six, the overview. In order to meet OSI and OSEP metrics, DCPS must demonstrate 95% timeliness on all annual IEP meetings, initial eligibility meetings, and reevaluation meetings. The good news is that currently DCPS is at 93% timeliness, very close to the target 95%. The challenge, though, remains that DCPS is only at 83% timeliness for reevaluation meetings and 72% timeliness for initial eligibility meetings. We must still maintain the great timeliness that we currently enjoy for annual IEP meetings while moving uh, to achieve our target of 95% and at the same time improve our overall timeliness for reevaluations and initial and initial eligibility meetings. We can take a moment now for you to stop 
and jot down some of your notes thus far. Let's begin an overview of the timelines. For initial evaluations, we have 120 days from the date of referral to complete the eligibility process. After eligibility has been completed, we have an additional 30 days from the date of the initial evaluation to complete an initial IEP. Every student that has an IEP must have an annual IEP review meeting. Reevaluations must occur every three years. <coughs> when the IDEA was reauthorized in 2004, provisions were added related to reevaluation meetings. Whenever a reevaluation meeting is requested within one year of the last reevaluation, the new provisions mandate that both the parents and the school district agree to another reevaluation. Scheduling the meeting. We are now on slide nine, and we will take another moment for you to jot down notes or questions. When scheduling a meeting, you should pick a date based on your school's Office of Special Education designated meeting day. That is the day when all of the related service providers are in your building. You should call the parent to confirm the date at least 90 days in advance of the due date of a meeting. Then you should generate a letter of invitation and send that letter of invitation via three different modalities to the parent to document your diligent efforts to get the parent to participate in the meeting. You should consolidate meetings whenever possible. For example, if a student has an annual IEP meeting and a reevaluation meeting due within six months of one another, you should plan to hold both meetings on the same date. You should confirm the date with the related service providers and other team members. You should notify all team members of the date as soon as possible. And you should send emails and reminders using um, either email accounts or the Google Calendar to confirm the date with team members. What does three different modalities mean? Well, it means three attempts in different ways to communicate with the parent. It does not mean that you offer three different dates necessarily, but that you offer a meeting date via three different ways. So one way could be a telephone call. Now if you place a phone call to the home and do not reach the parent, it is acceptable to document this as one diligent effort if you have left a message with a person residing in the household or if you have left a message on the telephone recording machine. Another way to send a letter of invitation is to hand deliver it if the parent comes to the school to pick up the child or in the morning if the parent is dropping the child off. You can also hand deliver a letter of invitation if you do a home visit. You can send the letter of invitation via U.S. mail. You can put the letter of invitation in the student's backpack and as a last resort, you can notify the parent that a meeting is going to take place via certified return receipt mail. If you do this, please make sure that you have a copy of the certified mail form before you send it out in the mail. Who gets the letter of invitation? Every IEP meeting you invite the parent to, you must send out a letter of invitation, even if the parent has verbally confirmed their attendance. Students over the age of 16 need to receive their own letter of invitation, and you need to document that they have received their own letter of invitation in SEDS. 
if a student is over the age of 18, then the student gets the three modalities, himself or herself, unless the student does not hold his or her own educational rights. There are rare instances where a family or someone else will go to court and petition for guardianship of a student that cannot make informed decisions for himself or herself. But we must have the court documentation. Otherwise, we will assume that the adult student is competent to make decisions, educational decisions, and the invitation goes to that student only unless the student has asked for others to be invited. You should document your three different modalities in the communication log in SEDS, upload any documentation, certified mail receipts, or copies of any other ways, emails, anything, any other way that you have uh, documented due diligence. The letter of invitation should be sent out in advance of the meeting, but no less than 10 calendar days before the meeting. For students of transition age, those 16 or older, you should contact your transition team to get a, to get a contact for when to send the letter of invitation to an agency representative that provides transition services. One example would be RSA. We are now on slide 13, and we will take another moment for you to jot down any notes or questions that you may have had from the last section, which was scheduling the meeting. Preparing for the meeting. Regardless of the type of meeting, whether it be an evaluation meeting, a reevaluation meeting, or an annual IEP meeting, you should collect documentation, make copies of all documents for the parent and the attorney, and have a folder with all the documents at the IEP table so that the team can reference the documents and be able to make informed decisions. You should have work samples, report cards, observational and anecdotal data, standardized test scores, behavior or incident reports, academic or behavioral interventions, and IEP quarterly progress reports. Classroom teachers and IEP paraprofessionals can collect this data. The parent should be asked to bring information about how the student is doing on homework, or how the student is doing in the home or socially in the community. The parent should also be asked to bring medical reports that are current or within the last year as appropriate for students that have chronic health conditions. Other school personnel can assist in gathering attendance reports that are very important to have at all of the meetings, disciplinary records that would include suspension and expulsion information, academic and behavioral interventions and corresponding results and any evaluations or informal testing. As you prepare for the meeting, 72 hours before it is to take place, you should call the parent to confirm their attendance at the meeting. Be sure that all team members can be present for the meeting. Check to ensure that all goals and present levels of performance have been added to the draft IEP and SEDS. And something very important, you should consider locating an LCD projector to project the draft IEP while the meeting is going on. Everybody can see the document in this manner, and as you make changes, everyone can also see the changes right there. When the IDEA was reauthorized in 2004, some provisions were also put in to allow for excusal of IEP team members for either part or the full IEP meeting in its entirety. The IEP member that is requesting excusal for all or part of the IEP team meeting must first put his or her written information, input, progress, and recommendations um, 
into writing, into a written report to give to the parent. And then a excusal form should be generated in SEDS, and the parent should sign that form before the meeting takes place, not during the meeting and not after the meeting. There are certain documents that you should create as you prepare for the meeting. You should create an agenda to help the meeting move along more smoothly. You should copy the procedural safeguards for the parent. You should have a copy of the meeting notes template on which the notes from the meeting will be recorded. You should have the sign-in sheet ready. You should generate a draft IEP and send it to the parent and in the attorney or advocate as appropriate before the meeting. If a student is 17 years old or older, and the rights, the educational rights under the IDEA are going to be transferred to the student, the parent and the student needs to be apprised of that before the meeting takes place. Pre-meeting meeting, what is that? That is when the team meets before the scheduled IEP meeting. In cases where a parent is represented by an attorney or an advocate, or where there may be contentious issues raised, such a meeting is definitely recommended. You should notify the Office of General Counsel if the parent is planning to bring an attorney, and the Office of General Counsel will let you know whether an attorney is to participate in person in the meeting, or via phone, or just simply be available for consultation. If the parent or attorney lets you know that they plan to tape record the meeting, that is perfectly acceptable, and you should arrange for a tape recorder and extra tapes so that DCPS also has an opportunity to tape the meeting. The purpose of a pre-meeting is not to determine, or not, not to predetermine the outcome of the meeting but rather to ensure that the team is prepared for any eventuality and feels comfortable discussing issues that might be contentious. It's also to encourage collaboration among teachers and related service providers. If transportation will be discussed, the pre-meeting should also include a representative from transportation. On the day of the meeting, Please ensure that you have a legally defined team per the IDEA. That includes a general educator, a special educator, an LEA representative that knows the resources of the district and has the authority to allocate those resources, and a person that can interpret test results. The person that can interpret test results can be one of the other team members, like the general educator, the special educator, or the LEA representative. The only time a general educator is not needed as a legal team member is when the student is attending a separate public day school where there are no general education teachers. In our district, those schools are Mamie D. Lee and Sharp Health. The parent is a legal IEP team member, However, if you have documented your diligent effort through three different modalities, you can go on with the IEP meeting and you should go on with the IEP meeting without the parent. If the parent has indicated that he or she is going to attend the meeting but then doesn't show up and you're not able to reach the parent by phone, you should wait 15 minutes and then proceed with the meeting if you have documented your diligent effort through three different modalities. You should determine who the note taker will be at the meeting. We will take a moment right now for you to jot down any notes or questions that you may have on preparing for the meeting. And we are on slide number 18.
holding the meeting. When you are holding the meeting, you will first introduce yourself as the meeting facilitator. You will have all IEP team members introduce themselves and their relationship to the student. You will review the agenda. You will state the purpose of the meeting. You will review the procedural safeguards document briefly. You won't just hand it to the parent. You will ask the parent to sign the Medicaid consent form. You will pass around a sign-in sheet, letting the parent know that this is simply to indicate participation, not agreement with anything discussed at the meeting. And you will ask the parent to state his or her concerns or interests. For an initial evaluation or a reevaluation meeting, you will review all assessment results and data. You will go through the disability worksheet for each suspected disability and complete the eligibility report. You will issue a prior written notice which states whether the child has been found eligible or not found eligible for special education and why. If the student is found eligible for special education and related services, you will state the primary disability that has been determined. You will then move forward with an IEP meeting if time permits. As you hold the meeting, you should go through each section of the IEP as it is laid out on the IEP document and pay particular attention to the various areas of concern. Whenever there is a need or a weakness expressed in the present levels of performance, you need to develop a corresponding goal to address that need or weakness. You should ensure that the parent understands each section and has had the opportunity to ask questions. If the student is 16 years old or will turn 16 years old during the time of the IEP, then a transition plan is required. When you discuss least restrictive environment, please make sure that you go through the continuum of services and educational placements and that as you move along the continuum, you have given legally sufficient reasons why the child cannot be in lesser restrictive options. We should always start with the general ed environment in the neighborhood school and then move along the curriculum. The curriculum is the general ed environment Next, it is the general ed environment with resource push-in. The next is general ed environment with resource pull-out. Then a special education self-contained classroom or program for at least 60% of the school day. Next is a separate public day school such as Mamie D. Lee or Sharp Health. Next is a separate private day school or a separate private residential facility, and finally, home and hospital services. Remember, if you as a team are determining that a child needs any placement more restrictive than a separate public day school, the case needs be, to be referred to the LRE team. You will close out the IEP and you will schedule another IEP meeting within 30 school days. Several decisions have to be made by an IEP team on an annual basis because it's not automatically a service from year to year. That would be extended school year services, transportation, um, and if a student has a dedicated IEP paraprofessional. So extended school year services is not summer school. The IEP team makes a decision of the child's eligibility based on data, three months of data. If the child is determined to qualify for services, then you need to indicate which goals and services will be on the ESY IEP, and they should be related to critical life skills. You will be considering the impact of a break in service on critical life skills, the degree of regression, on critical life skills and the time required for the student to recoup skills that he or she has uh, 
experienced regression with. Another annual decision is that of whether the student will participate in the regular state assessment or the alternate state assessment. In DC, the regular state assessment is the DC CAS, and the alternate state assessment is the DC CAS Alt. If the child is determined to be participating in the regular DC CAS, you need to determine whether it is with or without accommodations. Please remember that there is no more read aloud accommodation. You should not check that box. It is prohibited by the OSSI and it will invalidate the student's test scores. Transportation. There is a form that needs to be faxed into SEDS and an email that needs to go to ose.transportation.dc.gov. Any accommodations or assistive devices, um, you must contact your special education specialist in advance to arrange for a representative from transportation to participate in the meeting. We should always remember that we need to facilitate students' long-term independence. So if transportation is on the IEP, so should transportation training be on the IEP. Your consideration should consider the distance the child needs to travel to school, the nature and severity of his or her disability, the individual needs of the child, and the age of the child. As you finalize the IEP, if it's an initial IEP, you must have the parent sign the form for initial provision of services. Otherwise, you cannot implement the IEP. You should ensure that all documents have been entered into SEDS, that you fax the sign-in sheet into SEDS, as well as the meeting notes, the prior written notice, and the procedural safeguards receipt. You should make copies of the documents for the providers and the parent, and ensure that the parent has a hard copy of the IEP before they leave. And then you finalize the document in SEDS. We are now on slide 26, after the meeting. After the meeting, make sure that all providers and teachers have copies of the IEP and understand the accommodations and modifications in the document. If the parent has not attended, send two copies of the IEP to the parent via first class mail along with the prior written notice. Give the parent five school days to respond, then call the home. Leave a message if necessary and document all of your contacts in SEDS. If the parents haven't called you back within two school days, call them back and then give them six more school days to respond before you make a home visit. If you make a home visit, please take someone with you. And if you're still unable to contact the parent, please request that your LEA representative or your principal refer the case to the Office of General Counsel. We will be offering some additional resources, and you got some of them as an attachment with your meeting invite. This would include the meeting notes template, the transfer of rights directive, the directive on IEP meeting attendance, the ESY PowerPoint presentation. If you have questions, after today's webinar, please contact your special ed specialist or write to us at ose.compliance at dc.gov. In closing, I would like to thank all of you for your participation in today's webinar. I hope you will excuse the minor technical difficulties that we had at the beginning. And I would ask that you remember to fill out the survey and if you have additional questions, to please reach out to us at Central Office in the Office of Special Education, your special ed specialist, or anyone else that regularly visits your school to be of support and assistance. Thank you.